You're listening to a message delivered by Pastor Wes Taylor at Temple Baptist Church. We would love for you to join us at one of our worship gatherings at 845 or 1115. For more information about Temple, visit us at templechurch.net. I wonder if you've ever tried to open a file on your computer only to have it refuse to open. It's pretty frustrating. Uh, over the years, if you're like me, you've owned a number of computers and you, you found these files from time to time and you click on them and what is it? it gives you some kind of message like can't open file. Or if you actually get it to open the file, it ends up being a jumbled mess that makes no sense whatsoever. Strange symbols and codes and numbers and words out of order. To understand what the file's communicating, you've got to have the right program. That's the lesson of computing. But we find a, a similar idea in the Scriptures this morning. In order to understand or receive God's truth, we must have God's Spirit. And so in the passage we're going to look at this morning, we're going to see how essential the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Uh, Paul says that we need God's Spirit to receive the gospel, to understand the gospel, and to make the right response to the gospel. So if you have your Bibles, would you take those now and let's turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. And if you're brand new to our church, we are going through the, the, book of, the letter of 1 Corinthians, studying it so that we can, we can learn and grow as believers. So we're in chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to start down in verse 6. The Apostle Paul writes, we do, however, speak a wisdom of, uh, um, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words." The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment, for who has known the mind of the Lord, that we may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word, and we know that you said that your word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish your purpose where you send it. So Lord, send your word this morning into the hearts of everyone here to accomplish your sovereign divine purposes. Help me to faithfully proclaim what you have said. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So in the letter of 1 Corinthians, Paul is confronting disunity and factions that existed in the church at Corinth. Uh, these factions were part due to the influence of false teachers, but also due to the impact of philosophy in that day. Uh, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, turns out these guys and others like them were pretty significant in shaping the way people looked at life and, and thought, not just then, uh, but not, not just today, but as well back then. So in chapter 2, Paul continues to defend his ministry against these external forces. And so today's passage is, I think, a, it can be a bit tricky because Paul starts out in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, in the first person singular, I, but then in verse 6, he changes to the first person plural, we. 
And he continues this through the whole chapter. But then when you get back, get, get to chapter 3, verse 1, he reverts back to I. So why does he do this? Well, again, keeping the context, part of what chapter 2 is about is a defense of his ministry and preaching. So in verses 1 through 5, he defends that his message and the, the message the apostles proclaim is authentically from God. It's not a a message that can be found among the latest philosophy that comes out of Athens. It's not dressed up in in eloquence or big fancy words. It's not a secret wisdom that only a select few, that is the the really spiritual people, can can discern or understand. Paul's message is proclaimed with full reliance upon the Holy Spirit. So in verses 6 through 16, he makes it very clear that true wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit and, shows, and he shows us why the Holy Spirit is so important in our lives. So he gives us three, three reasons why this is true. Number one, we need God's Spirit to receive the gospel. So if you've been reading the letter of 1 Corinthians up to this point, you might think that Paul is, is against wisdom, but you'd be incorrect. Philosophy is the love of of wisdom or, or the pursuit of wisdom. And the Bible's not opposed to the pursuit of wisdom, but rather encourages it. Whole books of the Bible, many verses in Scripture affirm the importance of gaining wisdom in your life. In fact, if you look down again at verse 6 with me, Paul plainly states, we speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. So what the Scriptures oppose is a kind of wisdom that sounds lofty and intelligent, but it changes from age to age and sets man up as as self-sufficient, as as boastful and, and independent of his need for God. This is what Paul describes as worldly wisdom. Now, the alternative to worldly wisdom is not a pursuit of no wisdom. It is light. In other words, it's the right kind of wisdom. So you'll notice in verse 7, again, Paul says, No, we declare God's wisdom. So what is God's wisdom? That sounds kind of vague. How do you know if you've actually found it? Well, as we learned last week in chapter 1, Paul makes it clear Christ crucified is the power and wisdom of God. So this wisdom that Paul proclaims is not some special secret wisdom or, or a fuller gospel for the mature believer. It is nothing more or less than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The text goes on to show us two ways that the gospel was veiled from mankind and the one specific way God made it known to us. First, he says, this wisdom was previously hidden but revealed by God at the right time. You notice there in verse 7 the word mystery. That's a really important word. So when we think about a mystery, we think of something that's unresolved or unexplained, like an Agatha Christie novel. But in the biblical sense, mystery means something that was, was hidden for a period of time but later revealed by God. And so the gospel was a mystery that man could not penetrate, but God in His grace unveiled it to those who humbled themselves before Him. You'll also notice, if you look down in the text, that Paul goes on to make it clear that the gospel was never plan B in the mind of God. He states that God destined, or you might say predestined, the cross for our glory before time began. Now, how marvelous is that? When you really think about what Paul is saying here, before time and space ever came into existence... Before you and I were ever created in the image of God, God's plan was for Jesus to die so that he could bring us into a relationship with him. And he goes on to say in the text that this is for our glory. In other words, the cross wasn't just about doing the will of the Father. It wasn't just about satisfying the demands of God's holiness or justice in regards to sin, but it was for our glory. That is, it was for, it was for your good. It was for my good. God so loved the world, the Bible says, that He gave His one and only Son. This morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I appeal to you to open your heart to Him. I can tell you with absolute confidence that God loves you and desires a relationship with you. And I appeal to you to trust in Him before you leave this gathering today. 
The second thing that Paul tells us is that this wisdom was not understood by the powerful. In verse 8, he says, None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The rulers here refers to the secular and religious authorities in Jesus' day. Uh, Scribes and priests, Pilate and, and Herod. They didn't fully comprehend all that Jesus was. None of them understood that Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross was the plan and the wisdom of God. They couldn't discern it. They couldn't detect it or explain it. So Paul here gives us these two ways in which God's wisdom of the cross was hidden from man. But that begs the question, how has God revealed the gospel to us? Well, he tells us the wisdom is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. In verse 9, can we, somebody, there we go, got a, there we go. In verse 9, we see that Paul quotes a verse here from Isaiah 64 to make a point about God's wisdom. Now, you have heard this verse before. In fact, probably you heard it at a funeral. That's, that's usually the place you hear it. It's what I call a coffee mug verse. It's a verse that you, you, you see and hear everywhere on coffee mugs and, and t-shirts and, and mouse pads. And it's usually taken out of context to say something the Bible doesn't say. So most of the time, people in coffee mugs, they they appear to think that this verse is talking about the untold wonders of heaven that await God's people. Now, let me just say, it is true that God has many wonderful things planned for His people in eternity that we cannot fathom. But that's not what this verse is talking about. He's not talking about heaven. And He's not talking about Christ's return. He's talking about the cross of Jesus. How do we know? Well, we have to keep reading and we'll find out. So let's look at verse 9 together. It says, However as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. Now keep reading to verse 10. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. You'll notice it's past tense. God has already revealed it to his people. He's not talking about heaven, but the gospel. Paul is is simply saying that God did not reveal the wisdom of the cross to wise persons or to teachers of the law or to philosophers. The cross of Christ is the one thing that no one perceived or saw or ever declared. It is beyond human reason. So who has he revealed it to? Well, the text tells us in verse 9, to those who love him. How has he revealed this wisdom? Verse 10 tells us, by his Spirit. This is why we need the Holy Spirit. Because only he can give us the insight we need to receive the gospel. So number one, we need God's Spirit to receive the gospel. Number two, we need God's Spirit to understand the gospel. You'll notice there the second half of verse 10. It says, The Spirit searches all things, even the, and underline those next two words, the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, I ask you to underline deep things because in the Greek text, it can be translated as depths or areas, thoughts or concerns. As human beings, we may search for wisdom in many different areas. Dr. Phil, Oprah, the Dalai Lama, New Age thinking, the bathroom wall at the gas station. But only the Holy Spirit can search the depths of God's heart and reveal it to humans. The Holy Spirit allows us to cross the divide between our world and God's so that we know His will and thoughts. So to make his point known about the Holy Spirit, Paul uses a well-known philosophical principle of the world in his time. It's kind of odd that he would do that since he's criticized philosophy. Perhaps he's using this as a bit of a building bridge with with the Corinthians. But it's what the philosophers call a like-by-like strategy. So it kind of goes like this. Like things are able to be known by like things. Like things are able to be known by like things. So let me give you an analogy to explain what this looks like. Um, As I've stated before, I have, this is probably the one statement that's going to get me in the most trouble in this whole sermon. Ready? I have the world's most perfect, most wonderful dog. It's true. 
It's true. Her name is Daisy. I've got a picture of her for you this morning. There she is with my wife. Isn't she just beautiful? Now, she is the, sm- the smartest, the sweetest, the, the once-in-a-lifetime kind of dog. Now, I'm going to tell you, when that dog dies, you're not going to see me for six months. I'm going to need therapy or something. With all my heart, I believe God meant her to be our family dog. Now, Daisy might be our family dog, and of course, she's pictured here with my wife. But let me just tell you something. She's really my dog. I mean, that dog loves me above everyone else. I'm not just saying that. It's, it's a fact in the family. Everybody, everybody knows it. And I don't know why she does, but she does. Now, I often joke that Daisy and I have this unique connection that we understand each other, almost like we can read each other's minds. But the truth is, I can't read her mind any more than she can read mine. I think that when she's looking at me with those eyes of of adoration, that that she is looking at me and thinking, what an awesome master I have. But she might be just thinking, hey, you're the guy that feeds me, so I'm going to be extra nice to you. And here's Paul's point. The only person who knows you and who really knows what you're thinking is you. And similarly, what God is doing and thinking only God knows. Man doesn't know what God is thinking any more than he knows what his pet dog, as perfect as she may be, is thinking. And this again is why we need the Holy Spirit. The reason the Holy Spirit knows the wisdom of God is because of the triune relationship that the Spirit has with God. The Holy Spirit is not a force. Or a lesser entity, the Holy Spirit is God and is the third person of the Trinity. Thus, the Holy Spirit is, again, the necessary link between God and humanity. Because without Him, we would not be able to know the wisdom and the will of God. Now, in the next couple of verses, Paul talks about how we have the Holy Spirit. And we use spiritual words, explaining spiritual truths by the Holy Spirit. Now, it's possible that he's simply saying here that uh, we use Holy Spirit-directed language and words, and in other words, the Holy Spirit informs what, what we say when we talk to our, our, our children or our spouse or the people that we work with. Or, it's possible that's, that's what he means here. And, and, and plus, the Bible has that really scary verse in the gospel when Jesus says that man will give an account for every word that he speaks. So think about the idle, careless words that you've spoken just this past week. Did did those words indicate that they were coming out of your mouth, that they were directed by the Spirit or by the wisdom of this world or by your flesh? When that rude driver cut you off, Spirit-directed, flesh-directed. When you got into an argument with your spouse, Spirit-directed, Flesh directed. When you spoke about your parents to your friends, spirit directed, flesh directed. Now, I think it's certainly a valid application here of verses 12 and 13, but I believe that something deeper is going on here in the text. I believe that verses 12 and 13 show how the Spirit uniquely worked in the lives of the apostles to help them understand and communicate the gospel. And so this is where the the we of the passage clearly refers to the apostles. So in these verses, what we see is the the unique role of revelation and inspiration working in the apostles during the the New Testament. So first, let's talk briefly about revelation. We're not talking about the book of revelation in the New Testament. God's special revelation is his, his supernatural disclosure to human beings of truth that they would not otherwise know or are incapable of d- discovering or discerning on their own. And you'll notice in verse 12, Paul and the apostles make this point. He says, what we have, and then underline the next word, received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may, and here's another word to underline, understand what God has freely given us. God gives His Holy Spirit to all believers, but the apostles and the prophets had a unique, never-to-be-repeated role in Scripture that involved the Holy Spirit. So Ephesians chapter 2 
says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ as the chief cornerstone. So as God's messenger, the Holy Spirit communicated divine truth to them and enabled them to understand it. And then God confirmed that their message was from above by doing signs and wonders through their hands. As Paul says at the beginning of of chapter 2 here, that his preaching was not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So Paul is making the point that what he and the apostles proclaim to the Corinthians is they're not the words of human wisdom. They're not the words of man, but they're the thoughts of God. But it's more than just a revelation of divine truth that the Spirit gave them. The Holy Spirit provides the right words for explaining these spiritual truths to God's people. You'll notice in verse 13, he says, This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but notice this next phrase, in words taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities, not with man-made words, but what? Spirit-taught words. This is an example of the verbal inspiration of the, the Scriptures. Verbal inspiration means that the writers of Scripture were led by the Holy Spirit in the choice of words that they choose to communicate divine truth. And not just the the, the thoughts or the concepts, but the very words. And it's really amazing when you you think about it. Because even though the Bible was was written over hundreds and hundreds of years with different writers and different eras of, of history, different styles and personalities, God was able to superintend the process so that the writer retained his, his personality and his style, but he only said exactly what the Lord said. So that the words of Scripture, they're God's words. Why is this important for you and me? Well, we can be confident that the Bible is God's message It's God's message to man, not man's message to man. And whatever God has spoken in the Scriptures, it will come to pass. So the Scripture says in the book of Isaiah, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. That's good news. So we need God's Spirit to receive the gospel. We need God's Spirit to understand the gospel. But third, we need God's Spirit to make the right response to the gospel. Paul wants us to see how essential the Holy Spirit is for Christian living. So he draws a contrast between two hypothetical persons here in the text. The person without the Spirit and the person with the Spirit. Um, And and these are some of the most misunderstood verses in the entire text. I want to carefully handle them. So let's look at verse 14. He talks about the person without the Spirit. That is, without the Holy Spirit. Or as your translation might say, the natural man. What's he talking about there? He's simply talking about a non-Christian. That's all he's talking about. It's a person who eats and sleeps and works and spends time doing leisure things but has no thought of God Or eternity in mind. Paul's not saying here that a non Christian can't intellectually understand the Bible. That's not true. There are many non Christians that understand the Bible and perhaps even understand it better than a lot of Christians. What what Paul is talking about here is not a cognitive understanding, but a volitional one. This is a person who doesn't accept the things from the Holy Spirit, but considers them foolishness. And that word foolishness means dull, insipid, tasteless. So you might say it this way, the things of God are not welcome to the natural man. Don't we see this illustrated with friends and families who are not Christians? Haven't you seen this with people you tried to share Christ with? Your non-Christian friends say, you're going to church again? Why do you waste your time going to church on the weekend? You worked all week, the weekend is meant for fun. Why do I need saving? I've never done anything that bad in my life, and I'm better than most people. In fact, I'm better than most of those Christians that go to your church. What's the point of restraining myself? I'm not hurting anyone, so if it feels good, I'm going to do it. 
What kind of father would let his son die by means of crucifixion? I wouldn't do that to my own kid. None of it makes any sense to them to the, for the person who's without the Spirit. Spiritual truths are not appreciated. They're not believed or obeyed. In fact, it's, it's worse than that. It, not only are they not received, they cannot be received. They cannot make sense to them. The verse continues, he cannot, talking about the, the man without the Spirit, he cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So the man without the Spirit does not have the resources to appreciate, to understand and embrace what the Holy Spirit is trying to do. He cannot do it any more than a blind man could appraise the magnificent artwork of Rembrandt, or a deaf man could evaluate the beautiful music of Mozart. We wouldn't criticize such a person. We would understand that their inability to do these things is due to their condition. I think this is such a powerful point to remember when we're talking to non-believers. We should remember that when we're talking to non-Christians or, or we're talking about non-Christians, that we should be very sensitive to this fact. That we should not criticize them for not living like believers. They're not going to. They're not believers. They are natural men and women without the Spirit doing what is according to their fallen natures. We shouldn't criticize or speak ill of non-Christians living like non-Christians. We should, however, expect Christians to live like Christians. That makes sense. And the Scripture certainly says that. Verse 15 says, The person with the Spirit makes judgment about, judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to mere, merely human judgments. Verse 16, For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? but we have the mind of Christ. Now, there's, again, a lot of confusion about these verses, and some people have used them to justify all sorts of things. So when Paul says here, the person with the Spirit, he's just simply talking about a Christian. This is not about somebody who's had a second blessing or a second work of grace or a deeper mystical experience. You don't need your hands, you don't need hands laid upon you to receive the Holy Spirit. If you've trusted in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. So Paul's point is not that a person who has re received the Spirit is above reproach in all matters, or, or that Christians cannot be judged by others. Uh, you know, some sinful leaders, you've seen this in the news over the years, they've tried to, to take what Paul says here, and uh, when they're caught red-handed in some sinful, scandalous way, they say, well, you can't judge me. You can't judge me. And then they quote Paul here. Only God is my judge. Well, that's not true. We are called to make judgments about the rightness and wrongness of behaviors in the church. As we will see in our study of 1 Corinthians, Paul will urge the Corinthians to judge members of the church, to evaluate those who claim to speak for the Lord, for the Corinthians to examine themselves if they are behaving appropriately enough to partake of the Lord's table. But, but this is not what Paul is saying here. He, he, his point is that those who are spiritually mature are guided by the Spirit. And so when he says that the person with the Spirit here makes judgments about all things, he's saying that a mature believer is one who brings the wisdom of the cross to bear on every decision in his life. The cross of Christ will influence every attitude. There is no higher criterion, no, no human wisdom that can outrank it. Those who are spirit, spiritually mature are guided by the Spirit, who, by the way, searches the depths of God and reveals the, the mind of Christ. Paul adds that such a person is not subject to mere, merely human judgments. In other words, the world may pass judgment on us. Uh, they may criticize our beliefs, our standards of morality, call us narrow-minded, bigoted and whatever else they can come up with. But their appraisal does not matter. You know, there are so many churches today that are living for the praise of man. They are twisting the scriptures. They are distorting truth. They are dumbing down the Bible to make it say things that it does not say so that they can be respected 
so that they can receive the praise of a culture that does not know God. We are not living to hear the world say, we can accept that. But to hear our Savior one day say, well done, good and faithful servant. So let me leave you this morning in the next two or three minutes with two brief challenges that I see in the text. The first is this, never move away from the gospel in your life. Back in verse 6, Paul states that when he's among mature believers, he speaks with words of wisdom. And then he goes on to tell us that this message of wisdom is the cross of Christ. And so the fact that Paul says the gospel is his message among mature believers reminds us that we never move on from the cross only into a deeper, more profound understanding of it. Real growth in Christ is, is not seeking hidden mystical wisdom or knowledge about God. It's not found in chasing after the next experience that spreads like an epidemic through the church. It's found in a deeper understanding of the gospel. Are you bored with the gospel? Well, let me suggest that if you're bored with the gospel, you probably haven't thought deeply and persistently enough about it. The gospel is is not a message just for baby Christians. And then we, we move on to something bigger and something better. The best athletes in the world are those who consistently practice the fundamentals of their sport. Isn't that true? It doesn't matter how tall a man is, how high his vertical jump is, if he can't dribble a ball. He can't dunk the ball till he learns how to dribble down the court. And similarly, the gospel is the fundamentals of our faith. It's not just the beginning, though. It's in the middle, and and it's also the end. I'm sure you notice here that Paul talks a lot about mature Christians in the text, that he is grieved that the Corinthians are not mature in Christ. This becomes even clearer as we get to chapter 3. So how do you know if you're a mature Christian? Isn't that a great question? Are you a mature Christian? Are you? I mean, how do you know? How do you know if you are a mature Christian this morning? Again, the answer is, does the cross determine the decision and direction of your life? The most mature Christians are those who take the cross of Christ and apply it to every aspect of their lives until Jesus returns. So is the cross of Christ your solution for guiding a conflict between you and someone else in this church? If it is, you're a mature believer. Is the gospel your solution to your marriage and family difficulties? Does it guide your forgiveness and reconciliation process with others? Is the cross of Christ your answer for dealing with frustrating people at your school or at your job? If it is, you're a mature believer. We never move on from the cross only into a more profound understanding of it. Here's the second challenge. Take possession of all that the Spirit offers you. When a person becomes born again, they receive the Spirit of God. They are potentially a spiritual man or woman, but they are not automatically going to walk in the Spirit. It takes a decision on our part to do that. And this was the problem at Corinth. When, what do you do when, when the Christians revert back to being like the world? Paul says that the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. And and sadly, that describes many of the Corinthians in the church to such a degree that when you get to chapter 3, verse 1, here's what he says. And you can almost hear, you can almost see the tears running down his face. He says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. So to to avoid this, we must be guided by the Spirit. We must avail ourselves of all that the Spirit has. We must determine to love God with every fiber of our being. We must stay close to our brothers and sisters here in the body of Christ. The Scriptures make it clear that as we follow the Holy Spirit, that He produces His fruit in us, fruit like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and self-control. So I ask you this morning, will that be your decision? Will you keep the gospel 
front and center in your life. Let it influence and inform everything that you do. Will you avail yourself of all that the Holy Spirit has for you? Hi, my name is Steve Baer. I'm one of the pastors here at Temple Baptist Church. I just want to thank you for listening to one of our sermons, and I also want to invite you to take the next step. Maybe you need to discuss this topic with a friend, or maybe you need to start looking for a church home. For some of you, it's time to consider the claims of Christianity and take the next step in your relationship with God. But whatever your next step is, I want you to know that we're praying for you, and we're available to help. If you'd like to have a follow-up conversation with one of our pastors, we would love for you to contact us at the church office, or you can email us from our website at templechurch.net. God bless you, and thanks for listening.